I come from a family where my father worked for Parker Ranch my whole life. And when I say that, that means that I have ridden, I have touched, I have prayed to, and I've held ceremony on every inch of that mauna because my father was in charge of water for cattle, for ranch people. So the only reason I'm saying that is to say that today I am not speaking as an educator or even a cultural resource. I have to say I'm speaking as a kumu, which is a word that I can't even explain in these 15 minutes, but it comes from just life ways, from in the womb to this very moment. And my responsibility to this beloved Hawaii and I cannot, in 15 minutes, give you more than a glimpse of what it is to have a pili or a relationship, not just with the mauna, which, yes, is very sacred to us, and you are finding that out, I think, more every day, but to all of Hawaii and, indeed, beyond Hawaii. So what I'm giving you today is going to be one blink of an eye one glimpse, because I'm responsible to my ancestors, and 15 minutes, 10 minutes, one minute, that's what I've been given in the past weeks to speak about the mountain. And I have to let all of that go and just say, I can only give you this much, so please don't take anything that I say as a complete picture. I could do a whole semester class <laughs> on why I am now adding to what I am, besides of the most important as a mother, as an activist. So I'm not an astronomer, but I am an A word, and it's not another A word. It is an activist. I am. And I'll just say briefly, I never thought in my whole entire life that I'd be brave enough to be standing in a courtroom to say, no, that's not right. That doesn't meet the criteria. I never thought I would say that. I never thought I'd wake up one morning and say, wow, I'm in a contested case over Mauna Wakea. Who wants to say that? I didn't want to. And I've crawled to courage. I've crawled to courage and I've stood on that mountain and I faced armed officers. And I'm a mother. I quit my job this year. I've been a teacher right next door. I've been a teacher for 30 years. And almost 20 of those 30 years is right where I went to school from kindergarten, right next door. And I quit this year because there comes a time, and I'm just going to speak as, as the Mauna will lead me to speak, and I'm going to trust that you accept that because I'm very excited by your excitement about everything, you know, especially you're so excited. <laughs> and I, I love your excitement about what you do. And I want to address that in the best way possible because next week I'll be standing on that mound again. And maybe this time, like my daughter, I will be arrested. And I hope not. And I don't plan on it. But with my last breath, I'm going to be standing on that mountain. And I'm going to be telling you why in, in this very second. And please remember, I'm only giving you a glimpse of a whole lifetime and generations of people who are now descendants standing for that mountain, even when they don't know why. Even when they go up there with justified anger. Even when they go up there and they're learning every step of the way why they're standing at this time. So I'm standing at this time because I don't have a choice anymore. I'm not standing over science versus astronomy. And when they say that in the newspapers, don't believe that. I'm number one up there. I'm one of the spokesperson. I'm the mama on the mountain for the young ones. And I will say that with all the pride I have in my heart and in full humility. But I'm standing on the mountain because there comes a time when a people have the responsibility, the duty, and the privilege to say enough is enough. There comes a time when it's too big, it's the one too many, it's the one too big, it's the one that's going to go beyond the tipping point. 18 stories is not allowed on this whole island. It doesn't meet the criteria to build in a conservation zone, it doesn't. Just look through the criteria. We 
the people. And I don't mean just native people. I stand next to people on that mountain that are from Japan, from China, from India, from Canada, from Turtle Island, from Hawaii, all races, all ages, from babies to kupuna. We are all standing together because there comes a time when you just have to. When you have to say 18 stories, it's too big for my mom. And you have to be able to say that the mountain said so this time. Because as native people with ancestral connections, we are following guidance and direction. That's why we're brave. If you're wondering, just think about it. Is there any place in this whole world where you come from that you would stand for? That you would say, no, enough is enough. Not on my mountain, not in my water, not in my seashore, not on my hillside. So I just want you to un really understand what I'm saying. It's not about science versus culture. It's about an 18-story building on our mauna. And we know it's not the last one. That's why we have to stand. So really, is there in your hearts, any of you and all of you, some place where you would stand for, that very possibly you would die for, that you would sing for and you would chant for, and you would say, enough is enough. Because if there isn't a place, yes, you won't understand why I'm there. You won't understand why I'm there yesterday, tomorrow, next week, and as long as I have a breath. And it's not about astronomy versus science. And you're going to keep reading that in the newspaper, and they're going to play that one up till you know, because that keeps us divided. It's about meeting criteria. I mean, I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. In fact, I'm going to tell you in, in the six minutes I have left, I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you to show that first slide first. That's Mauna Awakea from Waimea a few years ago. Um, what makes a mother stand for a mountain? I'm going to say a few years ago, Actually, my daughter's 15 now, and she was about nine, 2009-ish. My daughter and I went to a very sacred place. There are still sacred places here. And she said, Mom, the Lady of the Lake is here. Because you know our young kids, they can still see when you have ancestral connections. They can see the spirit world. And some of you will just think I'm, you know, not making sense, but then again, you guys are looking for galaxies, so I'm gonna say we're all, we're all the same, and <laughs> you know what I mean? And she said, Mom, the lady of the lake said, try one more time, she's here, and she described her to me, and I said, try for what? What do I have to try? And she said, stop the telescope, because it's too much, it'll change everything, the elements will leave, the weather will leave, the energetic ley lines around the earth, will be affected by the mountains that talk to one another. It's going to be a disturbance. And I don't know if any of you believe in that. And I don't really care. Because that's what my daughter told me. And she said, you got to try one more time. And I said, I will. And I've been in it since, ever since. Terrified. Paranoid. Panicked. Afraid. But I'm not afraid anymore. I've crawled to courage from 2009. And I'm standing here and just saying that, and he's recording that, and he's heard me say this so many times, my friend David back there, that I'm not afraid anymore. But if there's a newspaper reporter in here, then I'm a little concerned. Because if he quotes me, I'm, I'm going to sound crazy tomorrow. But I'm going to just trust. I'm going to trust. So I'm going to tell you a story real fast, because I've probably got, what, five minutes left. Yesterday morning at sunrise, and you can go to the next slide. This is a portal opened above the mauna, and that's all I'll say about that. Maybe you can ask me a question later if you're <coughs> interested. Yeah, that was us yesterday on the mauna. Because some of you don't know that ceremonies happen all the time and more and more up there because we have to become stronger, wiser. We have to be more spirit-filled. We have to be kinder but stronger in our stance. and, and um, in order to stand on the temple 
In order to stand on the temple, the mountain commands and demands a type of behavior, your best conduct, dignity, integrity. And when you have 700 protectors standing on a mountain like June 24th, that's not easy to do. They fly in from everywhere. And in five seconds time, you have to switch everything you ever knew and you have to stand in the conduct that the mountain expects. And so we are changing and transforming by the second. So thank you very much for that permit request. That was so quickly sent right through in an approval, but that's okay because you who are part of that have enabled us to stand taller than we ever would have, so thank you for that. Yesterday morning at sunrise, we got there maybe about 5.30 in the morning. Why did we do that? Because the moon and the sun and all of the celestial beings, they teach us that at this time, we, we change season. We go from a time of cool or male energy and all of our energy, and we turn inward, and we go to a time of lono, makahiki, marked by the earth, the stars, and the sun tell us when to do that. It, they speak to us and they say, now is the time, and that was yesterday. And the only place that we can gather is on the mauna, because what we will bring out is a staff, and the staff is being held right here by Lanakila. Most of you know him, even if you don't know him, uh, in the kapa. And we introduce Lono to the most sacred place in all of the Pacific, which happens to be on Mauna Awakea, because there's a line in a chant that says, He pala Mauna Awakea, Yuna Mauna Awakea, seals the whole Pacific together. That's why the whole Pacific is rising now to protect the Mauna. So we show the Mauna Lono. Lono a kukini. Lono the runner. And we took Lono to Lake Waiau to mar the highest water in the world from the seafloor, the most sacred. And with us is 10 Pit River Nation natives who are here for a special purpose. And then we went to, if you don't know, the energetic heart of the island, which is Pohakuloa. And they were bombing the heck out of Pohakuloa yesterday. So we have to pull it underneath that bomb. There was a fire there yesterday, too, but you wouldn't know it because you weren't there. And they were desperately trying to put that out. But we pray underneath the bombs, we put the layer of vibration so that the pain to the aina is a little bit lessened because they feel it, they feel it. And the fire is burning under there, so one day Pele will take care of it herself when we cannot, just like with all other things. So from the energetic heart, I really want to share this most beautiful thing because I left the ceremony to come here, and I'm going to go right back into the ceremony after this. So I have to really watch what I'm saying because I've, I'm governed by Lono Kamakahiki, and what I say, I, I, I don't want to hurt anybody because I have to go right back into this ceremony when this is over. So this morning, this is the magic of Hawaii, when you have an ancestral connection that starts with the Mauna, Wakea, and Papa. Sunrise, we met at Honoka'a, maybe about 25 of us. Right down the road here, it was dark. It was about probably 5.15. Six o'clock, Lono, the staff, was carried out of Honoka'a. And we began a makahiki relay run that will cover this entire island. That means runners switch out all the way till Sunday. And I'm saying that just in case you folks are here, and plus maybe you don't participate in ceremony enough, and I want to share this with you because I'm in it, and I am that, because in the, we are lono. We are the peace, but we are the strength as well. So the runner runs it out of Honoka'a, and I get in my truck with my Hawaiian flag on it. I'm sure if you live in Waimea, you know that's me. And we run Lono out. And it took us, oh, sorry. Sorry, who that's time? OK, sorry. What I will say is if you're in Waimea on Sunday, Lono's going to be coming around the island. 
every footstep on the ground that these runners are running is to ignite the island in enlightenment, transformation, wisdom, strength, vision. And they're doing that for you as well as me. And 90% of people on this island don't know that. But until Sunday, if you're driving anywhere and you see a lono going around this island, they're doing that for you and me. Because this is the time. And that's part of why I'm standing for this Mauna. And if you ever really want to know why we're standing for Mauna Kea, just ask me. I'll be happy to talk to you about it because we're not going away. We're going to be here for the long haul. And that I'm saying in the love and the light of the Creator and my responsibility to that Mauna. So I just want to say that and aloha to all of you. Um, and I'm going to try and share with you just a, a few thoughts about uh, the future of Mauna Kea and what I call sort of a holistic perspective on that. Um, and in doing so, you know, I, I do a lot of public presentations and more and more I, I take off my sort of my CFHT hat and put on more of a community hat and a, and a representation of uh, the Mauna Kea observatories uh, that are up there right now. I'm going to start off by sharing a little bit of a, a personal connection that I have to the mountain to allow um, myself to show how I relate to the mountain, very much in the same way that, that Pua does, but it's, it's you know, kind of in my own personal context. Uh, and describe to you what makes Mauna Kea uh, such a unique site uh, on the entire planet for astronomy. And then I'll finish up, final slide, uh, that will resonate very loudly uh, with what you heard from Chemo about thoughts of resolution. So first of all, personal connection. Uh, this is a picture of my beat out truck that's parked out there. It had paint then. There's very little paint on it right now. I spent um, many, many hours. Most of the time on Mount Kea, in fact, is as a hunter. I'm an upland game bird hunter, do a lot of hiking. Uh, I'm here for 30 years now in Hawaii, and I'd estimate four or 500 trips uh, up to southern Mount Kea, mostly around the outer flanks, over 9 to 10,000 feet. So this is one of my favorite spots, uh, um, about 9,000 foot up uh, on Mount Kea with my truck. Um, and this is one of my favorite pictures uh, from my son uh, about uh, 12 years or so ago. He's now a senior in college, I believe. Uh, the subtext for this is when you're the last speaker, there's a pretty good chance you're gonna show material from previous talks and, and throw people off. I figured nobody's gonna show a picture of a dead turkey. <laughs> so it's safe territory to claim this one as my own. Um, anyway, this is my, my son, first up on Game Bird that he got, it was kind of an interesting story into itself. But I point this out as a nice segue to something that's wrong with this picture, and this little, this little yellow flower off to the side. So it's about 12 years ago, it's called fireweed. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, it is a noxious bastard, for lack of a better term. This is what fire weed looks like growing up inside of Mauna Kea. And it turns my stomach when I remember how Mauna Kea used to look. And I wonder if my kids will know Mauna Kea shouldn't look yellow. This is, this is a noxious weed that is taking over uh, the lower slopes of Mauna Kea right now. In fact, just last Sunday, I was out uh, doing some quail hunting. And this area was so inundated. A year ago, this had no fire weed in it. Look at what's happened. This is in the Kaohe region. It is wall-to-wall -wall fireweed, and it's this tall on this table. I've never seen it thicker or higher. Uh, basically, the word tsunami just kept going through my head, that, that this area, which I've hunted for 20 years, all of a sudden, in one year, you can barely get through it. In fact, my pants were bright yellow by the time I walked through this area of fireweed. So for me, this is, this is an immediate crisis of, of the environment right now. Uh, I've participated in a lot of these weed picks around uh, Hale Pohaku. I encourage you to do that if you're interested in a great program that Office of Mount Kea Management runs. Just go to the website. They have these roughly monthly. At least in that little area, we can clean out the fireweed and other noxious uh, plants that are in that area. But for me, um, while I'm, I'm aware of the sensitivities to the summit and the environment, uh, for me, the, the real issue right now is the immediate, uh, I would call it crisis, of fireweed taking over the, over, uh, the lower flanks of Mount Kea. I'm going to show you a little movie now. Uh, to give you a better perspective of the entirety of Mount Kea. So here's the summit. It's a simulation I, I generated with Google Earth. You are 17,000 foot elevation looking due north, so about 3,000 feet above the summit of Mount Kea. We're going to fly uh, due north um, right over the edge. And yes, it is in fact very steep over the north side of the plateau, the upper plateau of Mount Kea. So you're looking down from the horizon a little bit towards Lapalaihoi in the background. My May is off to the left off out of the field. Uh, most of these areas towards the ocean are, in fact, uh, planted eucalyptus. If this was all clear cut over a century ago, this is not the native Hawaii that uh, should be there now, obviously. It's, it's mostly barren in terms of its uh, 
uh, trees that are in there right now. Now we're starting to veer off to the uh, northeast of Mount Achaia. You see the Pu'u's down here. They're picking up this road. This is called R1. The hunters in the crowd will know that. It goes all the way around Mount Achaia. This is a spectacular region of black sand dunes on the left-hand side of that big Pu'u right there. That's about a two-hour drive in from Hale Pahaku on R1. You're coming around. You see on the right hand, this is where Parker Ranch land is. This is the fence line. Above that is all natural Mamani forest. Below that, it's basically been eaten out by cows uh, over the years. So we go hunting up above the fence line. Below that is all Parker Ranch line. There you see R1 curling around just above the fence line there, below a field, another field of Kuus. Here you see the main switchbacks leading up from Pali Pahaku, just right there above center of the field right now, going up to the summit of Mount Akea. There's these little pine trees that you go right by as you're driving up Mount Akea Access Road. Now we're going to turn left. Here is the new Daniel K. Inoue Sound Road, going right up and over at the top of uh, PTA that uh, Poo mentioned before. So if you're up here looking down as we are with the trucker hunters up top, you can see this uh, enormous uh, army. Um, airfield that is in place. You drive right by it every time when you're driving on Saddle Road, but probably don't realize it's there. Now we're coming along to the southwest side of Mauna Kea, and you're getting to the Ka'ohe region. See these little stripes cutting across? So those were cut in, I believe, by DLNR um, several decades ago for uh, improving uh, upland game bird management area. And this is the area that, in fact, is now filled in with, with that fire reef. That's exactly where it was last weekend. So now we're looking back again against uh, the background there. Waimea is up above the screen. Parker Ranch land above where it's relatively barren. Mamani Forest uphill from that. A spectacular field of Pu'u's on the southwest side of Mauna Kea that we're going to fly over right here. It's called Skyline Road. Take you up about 10 or 11,000 feet. Uh, the hardcore trucker hunters go up, up here. It's a rough ride, but it's a hard <laughs> field when you get up there. And then we're going to park eventually around, coming around this enormous gorge that is on the south side of Mauna Kea, cut in the last ice age, I believe. Here's Lake Waiau. I'm going to fly right over the top of that and then park it again uh, up on the summit of Mauna Kea. So I'd like to show this little video to give you a sense of the, the magnitude of this mountain. It is spectacular in so many ways, and it's a lot more than, than only the summit. For me, it's, it's really the center of our lives in a lot of ways. So it encompasses uh, an enormous region on the surface planet by itself. It's 33,000 feet from the ocean floor and, and it has an incredible diversity of ecosystems from what is underneath the surface of the, the ocean all the way to the high altitude vecchio bugs uh, all the way up on top. You are now on Mount Achaia. You're on the outer flanks of Mount Achaia. People tend to think of Mount Achaia as off in the distance, but in reality, in fact, if you could somehow drain the ocean, now I live in Hilo and I can imagine myself looking out over Hilo Bay with no ocean you see, three miles down is the seafloor, the, the bottom, and I'm actually halfway up Mount Akea when I'm in Hilo. So when I think of Mount Akea, I'm already I'm on Mount Akea right now. It's it's that big, it's that expansive. Uh, it's not something off in the horizon. It's not distant. Go outside, touch it. And you're already on Mount Akea. It's sacred to many, as you've heard. It provides sustenance to many. Evokes a, a tremendous spirituality, including in me. Uh, I'm, you know, I was raised a Catholic, but I still have a very deep spiritual connection to Mount Akea because of all the hours that I spent there. How you, how you could not have that, in fact, is uh, beyond me. It also enables views of the, of the universe that are profound to many. I've heard some of the, the excitement from our previous speakers about that. So how that works is the fact that geologically, and from a meteorology standpoint, Mount Akea is unique on the planet. It has this very gentle slope associated with it. As the winds come in off the ocean, having been undisturbed for thousands of miles, they go up and over the top of Mount Akea with very little turbulence across that, and that leads to, to the exquisite viewing conditions that we have on the summit. It's also, of course, a high altitude site, so that means it has low uh, humidity and uh, different forms of radiation, in particular at infrared and microwave regions, uh, can penetrate through to the summit, and that's allowed to, uh, the telescopes have been put up there to have a fair amount of specialization. Not so obvious in here. See these clouds? That's a diurnal inversion layer, sort of a long-winded way of saying daily clouds that roll in and out, uh, sort of the 8 to 9,000 foot level. I'll put this little movie in motion. This is from Mauna Loa, looking towards Mauna Kea. And you see the cloud layer that's in place there. The important thing is it never gets above Mauna Kea, its entire nighttime sequence. So this is a very common event. And when you're on Mauna Kea looking down at night, the nice advantage of this is that it's blocking 
city lights below. In fact, this is a low light uh, video from CFHT looking down towards Hilo. And you will see the lights of Hilo sort of glowing through here in the bottom. But just above the clouds, you have a spectacular view uh, of, the, of the universe rising there over the eastern horizon. So right now, the observatories consist of these telescopes. You see CFHT on the right and the radio facilities on the left. Again, an instrument of time out on any of the details, other than to point out that they all do different things, and yet they all work as a combination of telescopes to give you very comprehensive observations of, of objects. There's a tremendous amount of collaboration scientifically and technically. We don't work in isolation. Uh, I came from Gemini, and I work at CFHT. A lot of us in the field have worked on multiple telescopes over the years uh, through this sort of Ohana. The, the science impact of Hawaii astronomy is, without a doubt, first in the world. This is a chart showing what we call science impact, which is basically a, a metric of publications. And these are telescopes all over the world. And if you're below salt in this, this is a South African telescope. You're basically off the map in terms of, of research these days. Four out of five top telescopes scientifically in 2015 were on Mauna Kea. Year after year after year, Hawaii astronomy is number one. Uh, and something that I'm very proud of, and that's a direct product of the community on the Big Island that has made this possible. It really has. You may have seen this letter on the wall uh, that I and others crafted. Uh, just basically is a, a tribute to Astronomy Night, which is President Obama. These don't happen every night uh, that we wanted to commemorate. And there's some discoveries attributable to Hawaii astronomy right there, like Dark Energy, which was awarded a Nobel Prize for three people a few years ago. You saw this in a previous presentation with the discovery of a supermassive black hole, about four million times the mass of our sun. And this little symbol right here represents the black hole. And we know it's there because as you see these stars orbiting around an object that is invisible, you can deduce its mass um, and figure out that there is, there is in fact an invisible object there that we believe is a black hole. And then exoplanets. So just on the summit of Mount Akea, these are the first pictures ever taken of planets outside of our solar system. This one is a star very similar to our sun, taken at Gemini. This is also a Gemini picture. These little white dots, in fact, there's a fourth one now that's been discovered um, of a star nearby that uh, is, is absolutely remarkable. This one in tick on the right, this will be, I believe, in astronomy textbooks throughout the 21st century. It's only one time to get a, get a first picture like that, and it is truly spectacular. So I will finish off uh, with this nice picture from uh, one of the guys on our staff, Tom Benedict, that I thought captured sort of the theme of this, um, this will get together uh, rather nicely. Some, some thoughts on resolution. First one, sort of personal philosophy in that um, we live in an incredibly diverse environment here on Hawaii, particularly in Hawaii Island. And I believe that nature has taught us that diversity is a strong thing, not a weak thing. That those systems that adapt to changes in whatever it is, they do so because of their diversity, not because they're sort of monoliths that are unable to change. So I believe we had the building blocks for a resolution just because of our diversity. I see it as a strength. Our community surely benefits from examples of tolerance, but much more than that, where we actually cherish each other's differences and learn from them. I cherish Pooh's message. It was, it was moving, and your daughter's also an eloquent speaker. And I always learn things from, from um, the Hawaiian community, when I participate in this, I can only hope I can share a little bit of my enthusiasm back, and we learn from each other. That's how it should work. A lasting solution to the Mount Kai conflict can't be heavily biased in one direction or another. We're all neighbors, we're all community. And at the end of the day, it has to represent interest from a variety of, of um, aspects of our community, or it freezes in contention, it makes people feel like they haven't been heard, and that's just going to boil over into, into a dispute later on. There are many legitimate interests in the future of Mount Kea. Culture, environment, science, those are some of the obvious ones. They should all be heard, and something that I'm very passionate about is finding that sort of inclusive vision for the future of Mount Kea that, in fact, hears those voices and, and captures them in a future for our children uh, to benefit from. And finally, I hearken back to Kimo's words, um, and this I feel very strongly about. By honoring each other, we honor that mountain. We can't honor the mountain until we come together as people. That's not a state of law. That's not a state of physics. That's just people. <laughs> and, and we've got to start there if we're going to get this, get this back on the rails. So with that, I thank you for your time. And we can jump into a panel discussion. <laughs>